Good morning and welcome to our live broadcast at First Presbyterian Church. It is a joy to come into your home today with good news about God who loves you. We are located in beautiful Uptown Columbus on the corner of 11th and 1st. We would love for you to join us for worship or just stop by and say hello. At First Presbyterian Church, we welcome you with grace and gratitude for God's love. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is a great day to be together with you here at First Presbyterian Church. We are glad that you are here. I would ask that you go ahead and fill out those friendship pads that are on each pew. And let's take just a quick moment to welcome the people that we are worshiping near this morning. If you have any questions about our church or would like to become a part of our family, I would love to talk to you. Uh, you can come see me after worship or talk to some of the folks that are around you and they can help you with that. We would love to have you come and join this exciting family of faith. I want to welcome those uh, in our retirement community, uh, out in the community. We are with y'all. You are with us. We are glad that you are out there and want to say a special word of welcome to our robed community. Uh, and by that, I mean those that are at home in their living rooms with your bathrobe on and your cup of coffee and you're getting ready to join us. We are glad you are with us. Welcome home to First Presbyterian. If you will look in your bulletin, you'll see uh, a few announcements that are listed. You see Easter lilies, not too late to get in, uh, in honor or in memory of someone. Uh, on the other side of that, you'll see the um, reservation for the church family supper as this begins Holy Week. 
Thursday night, we will have dinner and uh, a Monday Thursday service. And that service will have both elements of Monday Thursday and Good Friday. So we will participate in uh, communion together, Jesus' last supper with his disciples. And then we will, uh, on the second half of the service, uh, walk a little further into Good Friday uh, to experience and walk with Christ all the way to the cross. Um, and since we don't yet have a Good Friday service here, here, I would invite you to join me at Trinity Episcopalian. I'll find it by Thursday, by Friday. Um, I'm preaching their Good Friday service at 6:30, so y'all come. Would love to see you there. And whether you come to any of our services or not, I would encourage you to. Uh, find a gospel. We are in Mark's gospel today. And as the week progresses, um, read through the events that happen to Jesus as we get closer to the cross and to the empty tomb. Um, we must walk with Christ to the cross in order to fully celebrate with Christ uh, on Easter morning. And however you do that, we, I encourage you to do that. You may join us, join others, uh, go online, just sit down with your Bible a little bit every day, uh, but it is important that we walk with Christ every day this week. Um, you'll see other announcements, see children and youth on the back, excited about our $40,000 goal for the global mission campaign, very exciting. Um, you see other uh, announcements there. Um, please take a look. Lots of great stuff going on. Any other announcements this morning anybody would like to raise for the group? Then we have come to celebrate this journey. Let us worship God. Please join me in the call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let us worship God. Please be seated. We come to this time of confession as it is at the core of our Christian belief. It is why one of the reasons God sent Christ on our behalf. 
It is because we know we have all fallen short. It is because we know we have all made decisions, both conscious and unconscious, that have separated us from God, from one another, and even ourselves. But it is not God's desire or design that we would carry this guilt and be weighed down by the shame, but rather that we would be set free. Therefore, with open hearts and minds, let us come before his throne of grace. Let's pray together the prayer of confession. God of all, you sent this world a savior. We confess that we struggle to accept him and his call to follow. We too have shouted his praises one day and crucified him with our disbelief, lack of trust, and perpetual complacency the next. Have mercy on our sin-soaked souls. In the name of Jesus Christ, wash us with his baptismal waters and fill us with his spirit of grace, boldness, and faith. The good news today, friends, is better than good. It is great and it is amazing. And that news is that there is only one who is fit to judge and condemn us, and that is Christ who came to be our Savior. It is he who gave himself on the cross, who thought was dead but not, and was raised on that first Easter, having overcome the powers of sin and death for you, for me, and for this world. Therefore, in, I declare in the name of the risen Christ, our sins are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. You guys did a super job today bringing in the palms. I appreciate that so much. It's kind of an unusual Sunday because we are celebrating Jesus coming into Jerusalem and they wave the palms to welcome him. That's, that's why we do that. But it's also the beginning of Holy Week, which is leading us to the time when Jesus was crucified. And I want to talk a little bit about that. I know it's also spring break, but let us focus on Holy Week. I have a devotion for you guys, which I'm going to hand out to all of you. And what it is, it's called um, Journey with Jesus to the Cross. And it sort of tells us the story day by day as we go through this week. One of the things that I want to, um, to stress to you guys or to help you to understand is this. Jesus was fully God. He was God made man. Let us remember that man part because he had all of the qualities of God. He was sinless, but he was also a man. So he had qualities of man. And one of the things that's always struck me was when Jesus, the night that, they, that the soldiers took him, he was in the garden of Gethsemane, which is hard to say, and he was praying. We've talked about how he prayed and he sweat so hard that he sweat blood because he was so 
nervous about what was to come. Now think about that for a minute. It's hard to think about Jesus being nervous, but let us remember what was about to happen was very hard and and scary. And he knew everything that was gonna happen. So he was talking to God and he said, God, I tell you what, I'll do this, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid. It's not, it's, it's gonna hurt. I'm not gonna like it. Do I have to do it? Do I have to do it? And he kept praying, if you can possibly, if there's any other way to save these people that we love so much and to save the sins of the world from, how how can this happen? Is there any other way? Is there anything else we could possibly do? Could you possibly not make me do this? And he prays and he prays and he prays for that strength. And you know what? It, It finally dawns on him, I have to do it. And he says, your will, not mine. So not what I want, God, but your will. Now that got me to thinking about times in our lives when we have things that are coming our way that are really challenging, that we're afraid of. Maybe it's a little out of our comfort zone, right? Maybe we don't like to speak in front of other people, for example, and our teacher wants us to give a book report. And we're, and we're scared and we pray about it. Here's the deal, you guys. When Jesus came and took away our sins, he paved the way for all of us to be able to go to God in prayer and to say, Father, I'm a little uncomfortable with this. I'm not quite sure how I'm gonna do it, but I know that you're gonna give me the strength. We had a play here over the weekend and one of our special, I know you know that, and I was gonna talk about you because Barry was a big part of the play and he got up in front of everybody and he had his mic on and he did an amazing job. And Zoe was part of the play. She had to gasp at all of the moments that were, that were gasp worthy. And they did a great job, a great job. They got out of their comfort zone and they did something that was a challenge. So that's what I want you guys to think about this week. Think about Jesus as a man. Think about Jesus having that moment of fear and knowing that what was about to happen was gonna be hard. And then think about him finding the strength through God to carry on and to do what he was called to do. And you know, the good news is He did it, he followed God's lead, and then he rose again. And that is what I can't wait for next week. I love Easter egg hunts, but I gotta tell you, next week when we celebrate the risen Christ, that's what it's all about. That's why we're here. So I want you guys to focus on that this week as much as you can. I know you wanna have a good time and you should, but remember that this is Holy Week and it's a really important time for us to be focused on God. All right, you guys, well, I'll tell you what, why don't we pray together and then we'll head upstairs. I got a really cool surprise for y'all, as usual, but this one's really good, okay? You know what it is? Well, we'll see. I stocked the fridge. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Anyway, okay, let's, uh, let's say our prayers. Dear Lord, thank you for loving us enough to follow God's lead and die on a cross. We celebrate you. We celebrate your life and your resurrection. Amen. Great job, you guys. Come on, let's go upstairs. Yeah, I may have stocked the fridge. We'll see. Let us pray. Dear Lord, open our hearts to your word and transform us by the power it contains. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson today comes from the book of Zechariah, chapter nine, verses nine and 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. 
and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second passage is taken from the Gospel of Mark, 
All four gospels give the account of what we call the triumphal entry, Jesus entering Jerusalem on the donkey. So we are reading from Mark 11, 1 through 11. And although this is fairly familiar to us, I would invite you to open your ears and listen for the fresh word of God. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus. They threw their cloaks on it and he then sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor, David. Hosanna in the highest. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> so in an attempt to continue to get to know one another, give you a little family history of my, uh, my family. Both of my parents are from Louisiana. Uh, my mom is from a little town called Monroe, Louisiana in the north uh, of Duck Dynasty fame, yes, but she did not know any of the family. And my dad's side, the Deeth side, uh, all in New Orleans. And so I grew up coming and going from New Orleans. It's where my grandparents were, aunts, uncles, cousins, um, the whole thing. When the Deeths came from Switzerland, they came to the United States, they came to New Orleans and started there. We're not Cajuns, but we've been in New Orleans for several generations. So those of you, how many people have been to New Orleans? Most of you. Okay. Okay. We'll have to take a mission trip for those who haven't, or just a trip trip. For those of you that have been, or those of you that haven't, you know that New Orleans is kind of a paradoxical city. It is dirty, it is nasty, it is crime-ridden, and yet it offers some of the most unique music and food and architecture that we find in any American city. It is a city that knows how to celebrate. It is a city that is based in Roman Catholicism, and it is a city that knows how to have fun. How do we know that? Mardi Gras. That's how we know that. So as I said, I grew up going back and forth to see grandparents and such, and when we got old enough, we started going to Mardi Gras. Now, when you hear that, usually you go quickly to the worst part of that, which is the drunken, debaucherous gathering of many college students and others who kind of stumbling around in the French Quarter, throwing catching beads, that kind of thing. And that is a part of it. And I will go ahead and confess that when I was in college, I used to take groups every year. We would go to Mardi Gras. I was not always going into the ministry. So, but there are other ways to experience Mardi Gras. For example, and the parades don't anymore go into the French Quarter because the streets are too small and the floats have become so large and elaborate that they, don't, they can't fit in there anymore. So they'll go, uh, they'll, they'll skirt 
the French Quarter on Canal Street, and they'll have another a, a route that takes it around uptown and such. So when, when I was younger, they would you would know when the next parade was coming, and everybody the and French Quarter would empty. You would go out into the Canal Street, you would do the parade, and then everybody would go back into the French Quarter. But if you go during the day, or you go even to some of the night parades that are a little farther out, distanced from Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras Day, the day before um, uh, Ash Wednesday you'll find that the parades are a little more family friendly. If you go during the day, you'll see that it's a whole different culture and environment. Whole families are there. People are tailgating, bring their coolers. Kids and adults are dressed up almost like a Halloween feel to it. One of the things I look for is the ladders that they bring. If you've been there, you'll, you can look down and outside of the city outside of the French Quarter, but in the city, you'll see the parade route sometimes lined with wooden folding ladders. It's a tradition there. Each family decorates their own, and sometimes from generation to generation, they pass down their Mardi Gras ladder. And on that part that kind of swivels down, sturdies, the ladder, but you also put your paint on it or your tools, they'll put a seat on there, and then they use their children as bead bait. That's right, bead bait. All right, they put the kids there, and if th those on the parade will look for the kids and throw it to them first. But it's a really neat tradition to see just all of it lined with kids and families and people having a good time. So again, there are different ways from what we automatically go to. And my parents as of late have lived on the North Shore uh, across Lake Pontchartrain in the Mandeville-Covington area. And so they too had their own set of parades and Mardi Gras is a whole month. It starts right after Epiphany, early January, January 6th. And from that point, the parades start weekend to weekend until they get to Fat Tuesday, then intensifies, more of them closer, uh, more intense and more fun until really the weekend before the Fat Tuesday is the biggest because people have the weekend off and that's when many people go downtown. So across the lake on the North Shore, we have our own, again, more family friendly, lots of kids in the parades and things like that. So my dad and I, for a few years, rode in the North Shore parade called Orpheus, uh, which means music. Um, Harry Connick has his Orpheus, which is the big fancy one downtown. This was not that. This was across the lake. My sister, I have a sister who's three years older. She and my mom rode in a parade called Eve. They were, these were um, uh, male and female crews. And so we experienced just a little bit of what that feels like, this parade mentality. And that's no joke there. These are social clubs, these crews, they call them. You pay to join, and while you do stuff throughout the year, you're really there to do Mardi Gras. Sometimes they have fancy balls and black ties, tuxedos, uh, but really the event is the parade. So you dress up, you pay for the costume, you pay for all the throws, that's all the beads and the, the stuffed animals and whatever things you are throwing, you pay for that yourself. It is not inexpensive, which again is why we are on the North Shore. So in riding several years, <clears throat> the last one, I had just started into educational track for ministry. And so I'm thinking, you know, how do we get these kind of people to be this excited about faith, about Christ, as they are these nasty little beads, these made in China beads that smell, they're dirty, but in the moment, you'll do anything for them. My mother, blessed sweet saint, not aggressive in any fashion until you put her in front of a parade. And then you look out, you step back. Be it child, older, adult, elbows are flying and mom's going to get her beads no matter what. And sure, it's fun. We want to catch that. It's right from the people who threw it to us. See how many you can get in that time. We have bags in my garage of nasty, old, stinky, dirty beads. And then when you're done, you kind of look and half of them are broken. The color's already flaking off. 
You think, what, what did I want these for and what do I do with these? It's just fun. And so the parade today has some similarities to those parades and some differences. So let's look at Mark's account. So we know this is the end of Jesus' life and ministry. He knows it. Not sure everybody else knows it. Although he said in chapters 8, 9, and 10 in Mark that he must be betrayed, suffer, die, and raise again. But they don't quite get it. They don't really put two and two together really until Pentecost. Even after they see Jesus raised after the resurrection, they're still in a state of disbelief and trying to put it all together. At Pentecost is when they understand, and then they go out to tell others because they have seen something they cannot deny that others must know, the good news of Jesus Christ. But Jesus knows. And it's interesting to see that in this passage, the majority of the verses are on Jesus' planning and preparation. Only the last couple of verses talk about the actual entrance. More of it is the preparation that Jesus makes, which tells us that this is exactly the way Jesus wanted it, that Jesus planned it and prepared it to go exactly this way. So he tells the disciples to go, go get the colt, go get the donkey. And our quick understanding of donkeys in that time is that they would have been used for general transportation. It would not have been uncommon to see people riding donkeys. It would not have been silly or foolish for Jesus to have ridden a donkey as the Messiah possibly, but not in general. And so as they saw it, I'm not sure what they would have been thinking. Clearly, Jesus also had orchestrated the crowd. How did they know he was coming? Somebody would have had to have told them. Maybe sent out the disciples to say, gather, gather the crew, I'm coming in. Why would Jesus, who is humble, why is Jesus, who is not seeking affirmation, put this kind of parade for himself together. What is that about? Well, I don't think it's about shouts of praise for Jesus really at all from Jesus' perspective. Their understanding of Jesus was that he claimed to be the Messiah. And they were there to see the Messiah. But, of course, again, as we've talked about before, their understanding was a powerful military Messiah that would come on a stallion leading troops with armor and shields and swords and chariots, showing the whole force coming in. And here's Jesus and his 12, maybe some others, 12 are walking, Jesus is on a donkey. But yet they've got the parade route set up, they're cutting the branches which is uh, an Old Testament tradition for welcoming kings. They're putting their cloaks, again, royal significance to that. And yet it is Jesus who comes forward on a donkey. It's as if Jesus is saying, I'm coming, you better get ready, and things are going to change. All the way through the Gospel of Mark, When Jesus does significant things and there are significant understandings, he tells people not to tell anybody. Mark's messianic secret is kept all the way through until here. It's kind of Jesus' coming party, coming out of letting everybody else know that, yes, he is the Messiah, and amazing things are getting ready to happen. So why is the crowd there? Well, what have they seen from Jesus before? Miracles, teachings, healings. That's the fun stuff, right? Maybe they saw or heard that Jesus had turned water into wine. Maybe they 
heard or saw Jesus walking on the water. Maybe they were there when Jesus fed the 5,000 and the many more who were not counted, so maybe closer to eight or 9,000. Maybe they were there to see Jesus heal different people and to do these miracles that made them believe that Jesus was something different. Why else would they be there? They want to see more of the show. So they're gathered to say, yes, Jesus, yay, save us, Hosanna. A compound Hebrew word, yasha, meaning save or deliver. And then Anna, which is beg or beseech. We beseech you, save us, save us. Again, not uncommon to welcome kings, but to welcome Jesus and his peasant followers on a donkey a little different. So Jesus comes forward. What must his face have looked like? I don't see him saying, yes, yes, it is I. I see him rather as the only one who really knows what's going on. Maybe a stern face, maybe a crooked smile, because he knows these folks are going to turn on him. He knows what his fate is. He is human like us. He would have been scared. He would have felt lonely. And yet shouts of Hosanna, blessed is the name of the one who comes, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From Psalm 118, as we open our worship services, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Right before that is this passage in Psalm 118. Blessed Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So what I believe is that Jesus knows that these folks are going to turn on him. Why do they turn on him? Because the show is over. After Jesus comes in, there are no more miracles in the same way that Jesus did miracles before he came to Jerusalem for Passion Week. The resurrection is a miracle, and there are other miracles, healing of the ear at the garden and some other things, but they were not for the same purpose nor designed for the crowd. He is done. And now there is a request Through his teaching, the next couple of days, his teachings become difficult. A fig tree that bears no fruit is cursed, should wither and die. We are those trees when we are not faithful and when we do not follow and when we do not bear fruit. That means when we are not participating in the ministry and following Christ. Other parables about following in the cost of following. People start to turn on Jesus because, number one, he wasn't the Messiah that was going to come into town, kick out the Romans, and take Jerusalem back, which is what they thought. That's what they had been led to believe. But they also start to struggle because Jesus no more says, I'm going to show you, I need you to make a commitment. It is a pivot. And many do not want to follow what Jesus is calling them into. And so they turn on him, and we know the results of that. So we are being called in the same way I believe to make that decision from being somebody standing on the parade route, a bystander, a spectator, versus somebody who is being called in to the procession to follow Christ directly. We all come to Christ in a kind of superfluous entry level way. We all come to Christ in a way that is a little more shallow because we got to start somewhere, right? But the hope is that we develop a more mature and deeper spiritual faith as our lives continue as our understanding of 
Scripture, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the world, ourselves, grows. And Jesus is saying, I'm not throwing the beads anymore. I need you to come follow me to the cross. Woohoo! He wants to go with Jesus to the cross. Nobody. And I don't know that we're any different now. Our temptation is to go from today, generally a positive experience, even though we know there's some other dynamics, to Easter, Sunday to Sunday. If we do that, we completely miss what we're being called to do and be. We must walk with Christ to the cross. Again, whether you follow us here, whether you participate in other services, or whether you sit down with your Bible at home, walk every day with Christ to the cross. We cannot fully celebrate that Christ is risen on Easter without walking with him to the cross. Well, I don't want that kind of sacrifice, preacher. I appreciate it. Think about your life. Think about if someone were to say to you right now, what are the most important things in your life, the most important events, the most important people? My guess is it would be parents, children, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, family, friends that have been with you a long time. And what is it that makes those relationships special? Well, family you don't have a choice. You're with them, you grow up with them, you gotta stay with them. You find a way to survive for the most part. Families aren't always safe or come out on the good side of things. Friends you're with a long time because you've spent time together, you've worked things out. And guys, sometimes this is harder for us, so I'll give you an indicator of how you know your friends are close to you in the male world. If you ask them to help you move from one place to another and they say yes, that means you're technically going steady as friends. What, what's the common denominator? Sacrifice. You sacrifice for your children. Your parents sacrifice for you. Friendships sacrifice for one another. Those great accomplishments in your life, vocational, educational, other great things that you have done, you have sacrificed to make those things happen. The greatest things in your life have come through sacrifice, different levels, different times, whether you have wanted that or not. Faith is no different. Christ is no different. And Christ isn't just saying, give me a little time. Christ is saying, you make me the sacrifice and I will change your world. Come to me. So easy for us to watch as a bystander as faith and life go by. And we get to the end of our lives and we think, what, what have we really done in faith? Not really about church. It is about who we are as God's children in the world. And I don't want us to miss it as individuals, as families, as a faith community. Yes, the afterworld is where we're heading, the afterlife. So much of Christ is about that, but so much is about right now. We are being called to decide right now. Things can change. Things may become harder. That's what Jesus told all of his disciples. Don't think following me is any kind of joy ride. There is joy, but not necessarily happy all the time. We know better than that. As a matter of fact, it should be harder because we follow Christ. We are being asked to make a decision. There's a young man whose name is Gene Donaldson, and he was a star high school football recruit. And he had several schools that were calling on him, trying to recruit him to go. And the coach of Kentucky, is the only one of that crew trying to recruit him, figured out that he was a Roman Catholic. So he sent his assistant and says, you go and you dress like a priest. You wear a black shirt, you wear a black suit, you wear a collar, and you put a cross around your neck. And when you get there, you tell this kid that the Pope wants him to come to Kentucky. 
That coach, anybody? Bear Bryant. Bear Bryant. And don't you know it? Gene went to Kentucky, became one of his first All-Americans in football there. The kid made a choice. And you're being asked to make a choice today to commit or recommit yourself in a way that moves us from superficial. And superficial is a place to start. Don't feel bad if that's where you are. That's where we all start. But to get to the next level so that we will know the fullness and the depth of the joy and grace and love of Christ. So often we ask, where is God in my life? I don't feel the presence of God. Christ, Holy Spirit are not with me. Are you looking? Are we listening? What are we doing to try to make space for God? And that's often where we find the difficulty. So today is a day that we celebrate. Today is a day that we lift Christ up for his final journey, but he knows where he is going, and that is to the cross. And we are called to sacrifice. We are called to walk with him and experience the pain of the cross that we may fully participate, celebrate, and allow ourselves to be raised on Easter Sunday. So let us take this seriously. Let us look at our lives and see how we can start to find that place of depth. If you don't know, come and talk to us. It's why we're here. God doesn't expect us to do this on our own. It's why we have a faith community. So let's go together. And the time and the question is, will we remain bystanders in faith or will we join the party? And Christ is saying, come, follow me. It will not be easy, but you will be amazed at this life that I have given you. So let us walk together in this procession with Christ to the cross and then to the empty grave. Alleluia. Amen. Please stand and let's say what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated and let's pray together. Lord God, what a joy it is to be your people. And you call us to celebrate the journey that you have placed us on. But that journey is not always easy. For we come to you often with a superficial faith. And you are calling, begging us to come deeper, to come closer. That we would see, feel, hear, taste, and see that you are with us. And that you have given us gifts that we can share with the world, that they would know your grace and your saving joy. But Lord, you also call us to the cross. And that is a challenge for us. We sacrifice a lot in this life for a lot of things and a lot of people. Help us to see that you are not just one more thing one more extracurricular moment, or even another thing to be sacrificed for. But to be at our core, that all that we do would be to worship and honor you. Help us to dedicate and rededicate our lives to you today, that we wouldn't be Mardi Gras Christians, those who were here just to catch the beads and then we go home and about our business but ones who know 
and long for a deeper sense of your love and faith. Lord, give us courage to walk with you toward the cross this week. We pray for those who are struggling in mind, body, or spirit, those who have lost loved ones and are grieving, those who are challenged in life, those who are battling dysfunctional relationships or addictions of any kind. Lord, we pray for the darkness that sometimes seems to take over this earth, the hatred, the violence, the war, those who seek power by oppressing others and then only know how to keep it by oppressing others. Lord, we pray that those obstacles between us and you in this world may cease. We ask that you would care for our leaders in government, that they would follow your spirit. We cannot do this without you. We pray for those who serve in our military in any capacity. Keep them safe, keep them loved. Give them a sense of your peace in their hearts no matter what situation they find themselves in. Help them to feel connected to their families, their home, to their churches, to their country, and most importantly, Lord, to you, to let them know they do not walk alone. I pray for this church family, that you would help us to rededicate ourselves as we seek to follow you into our coming days, months, and years. That we would all together seek this depth of faith and then celebrate together in the good times and the bad and the ways that we see you in our lives. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray together saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now what do we say? How do we start to begin this sacrifice, this new life? Let us begin as we collect our tithes and offerings.
Dear God, we thank you for the gifts given and the sacrifices made in this offering. We ask your blessings on these gifts of time, talents, and treasure, that they would be used to further your love and grace in your world. Amen. And now go forward out into this day that God has made for us and know that we are being called from being bystanders to participants to sink into our journey with Christ in a more meaningful, powerful, faithful, and sacrificial way. And this week especially, let us walk with Christ to the cross so that we can fully celebrate next Sunday the fact that he has risen. And now may God's Holy Spirit fill your heart, fill your life, transform you from the inside out, give you every gift that you need to go into the world to be a bearer of his light, truth, and grace. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you.